It's nice to see that John Carpenter is suddenly relevant again. The man's movies were often mangled on release, but have aged beautifully in most cases, so it's probably balanced out. I guess it's a combination of the modern horror movie fans love for him, his recent Lost Themes album and Christine music video, the fact that he scored the recent Halloween movie, the scintillating tintillation that he could hop into the director's seat again, and that he seems like a cool dude. I want to take a look at his filmography, as he's one of my favourite filmmakers. The first John Carpenter movie I ever saw was The Thing when I was a kid. I didn't know who the guy was and I didn't know what the film was about. I just remember seeing the name of this film on TV. The Thing. What thing? What kind of thing? No, just The Thing. It's such a simple title but simply because of this enigmatic title I sat down to watch the movie and was completely unprepared for the barrage of gut-wrenching gore-tastic effects and unbearable on-screen tension. My mouth, despite already having been trained by aliens and predator, was blown wide open at some of the stuff I saw. The absurdity of the effects, how wild and creative they were, that's what you remember as a kid, these special effects, so vivid, so nightmarish. Later on you appreciate the craft and the tension, but as a nine or so year old child the takeaway is, what the hell did I just watch? To this day it's probably the only film that scared me through its effects alone. That scene where the doctor pumps the man with the defibs and the guy's stomach opens up and rips his arm off, sheesh. And on top of all that the ending floored me. The eerie cliffhanger, still discussed among film fans today. So needless to say, I thought this guy Carpenter probably knew his stuff. It was quite a while before I watched another one of his films though. I liked the thing, but at the time I didn't consider myself a horror fan. In fact, I actively avoided horror movies, unless they involved sci-fi monsters like in the aforementioned Aliens and Predator movies. I spoke about this a lot in my Halloween franchise podcast, so I won't go into detail here, but I had a fear of horror movies in my youth. I was bigoted in the sense that I co concluded I don't like them, even before watching them. But at a later time, I convinced myself to watch Halloween, Carpenter's other most famous movie, and from there I felt I discovered a whole new world. The movie itself was exceptional, and it drove me to seek out all sorts of horror movies. And today, I consider myself a big horror movie fan. I also sought to complete Carpenter's own filmography. His first movie, Dark Star, I think I watched after almost seeing all his movies, his other movies. It's pretty hard to find. The man himself doesn't even consider it his first film, as it was a student project that Carpenter and future alien scriptwriter Dan O'Bannon worked on while they were in college, about a group of people in a spaceship whose job it is to destroy unstable planets. If Carpenter's embarrassed of it, it's a shame, because this movie is definitely worth watching if you manage to seek it out. It's a quirky, offbeat comedy with some funky low-budget 70s effects, including a bizarre, tickling alien that is clearly a painted beach ball. A lot of the classic sci-fi tropes are there, like man contemplating his place in the universe and dangerous AI, but there's a peculiar spin on all of these kind of things. Interestingly, the film managed to capture the sense of isolation of deep space quite well. I really liked it. It's quite demented and pretty funny. The highlight is a computerized bomb deciding that he doesn't want to take orders anymore and begins to ponder on the meaning of life and the reality of reality. Carpenter's first proper picture was Assault on Precinct 13, which is basically Rio Bravo, transported to violent urban gangland 1970s. A patrol officer, who is black by the way, the beginning of a heap of unorthodox Carpenter protagonists, which is worth mentioning as black protagonists in a movie that has nothing to do with race wasn't the norm in those days. Today filmmakers are heaped with unworthy praise for having a minority in a lead, but Carpenter did it all the way back in a much harsher climate. Anyway, he ends up having to team up with two criminals and a secretary in a station that is victim to an onslaught of gang members who have declared war on the police. It's like a PlayStation game, wave after wave of criminal scum that are almost like zombies and a small band of heroes and anti-heroes in an isolated, secluded area. I saw this film many years ago, when I was a kid, and remember finding this film quite dry. 
It's only later you appreciate films like these more. The characters are great, you truly root for them to make it through, and on a technical level, despite the budgetary limitations and being shot in 20 days, the film is well made and the action scenes are well shot and exciting. It's tense and it's tight. The sound effects of the windows crashing and the gunshots were great. Of course, the movie is most known for two things. The first is Carpenter's electrifying synth soundtrack. He scored most of his own movies and he was a great composer. The second is a scene near the beginning of the film where some gang members are terrorising an ice cream van and a customer, a small girl, comes back to the van after realising she's been given the wrong flavour and she's casually shot in the chest and killed instantly. It's so cold-blooded, so shocking that this would happen all of a sudden and be so as a matter of factly. The killing of a child is such a taboo thing and I heard Carpenter was told to get rid of it by the MPAA when he sent it to them and he quite simply ignored them and released the film with this scene uncut. The balls on this guy. The film is quite vicious. It feels angry and relentlessly fierce. It kind of also has that video nasty feel. It's brutal and unapologetic. It does feel a little thin but it is a picture worth watching nonetheless. And then obviously came the masterpiece Halloween, the movie that is often touted as the granddaddy of the slashers, even though there's no blood, and there were quite a few slasher flicks before Halloween. Whatever its influence, the movie itself is a tour de force exercise in suspense and tension, offering numerous scenes of nail-biting horror. Again, Carpenter would score his own film, this time his music going down as one of the all-time great film scores. It's so simple too, and so is the film itself in its setup. It's really one of the defining characteristics of John Carpenter's movies, in that so many touches of his, so many elements of his movies are basked in brilliance but at the same time so simple, stripped down and basic. Take Halloween's premise, a madman lunatic, who killed his sister, escapes from an asylum and his psychiatrist heads after him. Simple story, but executed with style and finesse. I did talk about Halloween quite a bit in my Halloween franchise podcast, so I'll move on. Interestingly, Carpenter had just directed one of the most successful independent films of all time in Halloween, but his next two credited works were made for TV. The first was a little movie called Someone's Watching Me, a Hitchcock-esque thriller about a woman in her apartment who receives tormenting calls from a stranger who can see her with the telescope from one of the numerous apartments visible from the block opposite her window. Cue a lot of rear window inspired scenes of the protagonist staring out of apartment into the night, looking for the pair of eyes staring back. I would really recommend this film if you're able to find it. Horror fanatics will notice numerous homages to things they're familiar with like Hitchcock, De Palma and the giallo genre. It's packed with tension and acts as a testament to Carpenter's ability, his technical ability, to orchestrate terror through miss and scene, gliding camera movements and shot composition. It acted as a proof that the man wasn't a one-trick pony and could transport the practices and elements that made Halloween su a success into a slightly different environment. Nothing happens much in this film when you think about it. Of course the bubbling suspense does build to a climax, but the film kind of represents the Hitchcock statement of suspense being a time bomb under a table not going off, as opposed to going off. This is a tight thriller, with genuine tautness and a decent, a bit abrupt ending. I gotta say, there's also something about the grainy, made-for-TV aesthetic that I really dug. That kind of look from, you know, Dallas and the Spider-Man TV show from the 70s, which I guess all TV shows and movies from the 70s had, but for some reason I really find it aesthetically pleasing, and it made a stimulating change from the usual, although brilliant, classic Carpenter widescreen format. His next made-for-TV project was also his first pairing with Kurt Russell, who he would go on to form quite the partnership with. Elvis was released in 1979 and is a lengthy two and a half hour long biopic of the King of Rock and Roll. This film I watched in order to complete Carpenter's filmography. I had no genuine interest in seeing the film and I did find it a little dull and dreary. Russell was good as Presley. His resemblance, what with his mannerisms and voice, was uncanny, but the whole subject in general is just really uninteresting to me. 
I felt the film to be unnecessarily bloated too, with too many scenes devoted to characters just staring at brick walls in thought, and there being a template in that we get a snippet of Elvis's life, but then it'd be interrupted with a musical number, and then this would repeat over the course of the film. Of course, this is great news if you want to watch a film to hear Elvis's music and learn about his life, and most who see the film will do, but long story short, I was quite bored, if not mildly interested in the telling of the man's life. I felt like the movie lacked the energy you'd expect it to have, and instead it's quite gloomy and blue. 1980 saw Carpenter return to his element, the fog. An unearthly fog rolls into a small coastal town, exactly 100 years after a ship mysteriously sank in its waters, is how the plot outline goes. The fog is a weird one. On paper, I probably am not supposed to like it, because it doesn't really work. For one, it's not scary. Carpenter wanted and failed to get the movie a PG rating, and his goal makes sense because since because of a lack of actual horrors, perhaps the movie would work better if packaged as a family horror movie, kind of like Poltergeist. The movie also has numerous protagonists and there is no clear main character among Adrienne Barbeau's radio host sitting atop the lonely lighthouse, Jamie Lee Curtis's traveller hitching a ride on both Tom Atkins's truck and Tom Atkins himself, in what must have been the quickest lay in film history, and numerous other folks here and there, though a lot of the characters end up in the same boat and band together during the movie's final few scenes, the bulk of the film does feel quite unfocused, as a result of the numerous characters. It's also quite a dumb movie, characters make awful decisions, and I was baffled at how a corpse got up and started walking, and no one saw any reason as to mention it again, or to say, hey, hang on, what the hell, a corpse has just gotten up and started walking. Is this not a big deal to anyone? And though there is an initial creepiness to the approaching fog and the fact that it leaves people dead after leaving, when you find out what's exactly in the fog, it is quite disappointing and shreds the movie of what little horror it had. There are holes in the story and things that don't make quite sense and it's quite a long while before things get going. With all that being said, I really like the fog. Why? Well, mainly because of one thing it executes so well, atmosphere. Like I said, it's not a scary film, but boy does it have a spooky and chilly feel to it all. It did take me a while, I remember, to summarise and work out my mixed feelings on the film after my initial watch, my disappointment that it lacked the acuteness and scariness of Halloween, but it was still almost as entertaining and effective. Why? And the answer was atmosphere the feel of the film. Break it apart and analyse elements like the script, the acting, the costume design, the exhausted smoke machine, and you're left with a mediocre film, but the atmosphere, wow. It's quite simply the touch, the magic that is the craft of John Carpenter, which elevates the film. Destined to be obscure and lost in the overpopulated world of 80s horror, and it turns it into a product with identity, spooky, unnerving, mysterious, scenic and eerie are appropriate ways to describe this flick. In fact, it might just have the most effective atmosphere in any of Carpenter's movies. It's dripping with the gothic stuff. And like I said, it's not scary. The aura never steps into the field of dread and fright but it dangles in that zone where you actually enjoy it instead of being scared by it. I'm not gifted with the technical knowledge of the ins and outs of movie making so as to how the overall feeling of spookiness is achieved, but the music is definitely a factor. The music, again Carpenter's own, is very, very chilling and ghostly. It is well in contention to being the best Carpenter score if you listen to it in its entirety, and it goes so well with the film. The setting and location is also for sure a prominent reason. Antonia Bay, the lighthouse, the misty morning seashore, the waters, the small town feel, and of course the fog itself. All of these little bits feel like they have a history. The lighthouse is ominous, the sea's threatening treachery, and the fog's arrival, accompanied with the steadily escalating thumping of the school, is heart pounding. Oh, I almost forgot to give credit to cinematographer Dean Cundey, of course. 
a staple of Carpenter's filmography and one of the reasons why his films were often blessed with striking and accomplished photography. The Fog might be a minor film among Carpenter's more celebrated works, but it's one that cements his skill at setting the mood at the very least. There's a lot to love with The Fog. Films like this don't get made today. It's a cliche to say, and probably redundant since there's been a lot of recent good research of successful atmospheric horror movies like It Follows, The Witch and Hereditary. It's a good time for horror movies, but The Fog does leave you with a burning desire for the be to be more of an abundance of horror movies made with craft and care instead of filled with shock and CGI. For his next project, Carpenter ventured into sci-fi territory with what is now the cult action movie Escape from New York, starring Kurt Russell as the iconic Snake Plissken. Plissken is sent to New York, forced to go to Manhattan Island, now a prison island, to rescue the American president whose plane crashed there. This movie oozes coolness. It is just so unapologetically badass. First you have Plissken, the inspiration to Metal Gear Solid Snake by the way, Carpenter's answer to the man with no name, a soldier turned criminal, a man who doesn't give two hoots about anyone, a man who is a walking survival machine, a terminator. You also have Lee Van Cleef angel eyes himself as the gruff government man who puts Snake in his predicament. The rest of the cast is made up of Carpenter regulars that fans will of course recognise, like Donald Pleasance and Adrienne Barbeau. Escape from New York has that anti-establishment feeling, that fight the power, fight the man aura that is common in numerous Carpenter films, most obviously in They Live, made a few years later. Of course, it was made just after the Vietnam and Watergate scandal, so the sentiment was, I'm guessing, not too uncommon throughout the public, and therefore throughout most movie-going audiences and the films themselves. I love the characters in the movie. They were so quirky and cool in their own way, from Brain and Cabby and the Duke especially. They're also memorable, and I imagine in an alternate universe, a comic strip or TV show covering all the colourful characters of the New York prison state. It's also quite a scary movie, isn't it? Especially today, when a lot of the ultra-fascist ideas from the villains and blatant human rights violations carried out aren't too far off from some of the stuff going on in the world today. And there's that choking sense of injustice and rage at the fact that Pliskin is forced to work for these villains, and they're the guys in charge. You come away from this film hating the government guys more than guys like the Duke. One of the most endearing things about Escape from New York is that the low budget is evident, but it doesn't detract from the experience. You can tell they didn't have heaps of cash when filming, and yet somehow this makes the movie more appealing in a unique way. The fact that a lot of the filth around the streets is actually what was there when they shot the movie, the matte paintings, although not of Star Wars level quality, are still admirable in the effort and craft, and the chandeliers on Cars Man, it doesn't get funkier than that. Well it does when Carpenter is scoring your film, which he did again here, delivering a synth grooviness that perfectly captures the essence of the low budget, high talent, sci-fi action spectacle that is Escape from New York. So Carpenter by now had proven that he was an adept genre filmmaker, had he bowed out now, he would have left the scene with a respectable little filmography, and horror fans would remember him always as the man who gave us Halloween, much like how Tob Hooper is beloved for giving audiences the text for Chainsaw Massacre, even though his later filmography never matched up to his early hit. But Carpenter's next film, the second adaption of the short novella Who Goes There, The Thing, cements his reputation as a horror legend. He's no longer a great horror movie director, He's now hit the stratosphere, he's one of the top dogs, in contention when people ask, who is the best horror movie director? Even if his output was relatively short by this time, it's a testament to how fantastic and well-loved at least Halloween and The Thing were. But it wasn't though, was it? Strange as it is to say, when The Thing came out, the critics annihilated it and it flopped at box office. Perhaps it was because everyone was still in sci-fi gooey gooey dreamland after Spielberg's E.T., who knows. But it's a shame, and funnily enough, a noticeable trend in Carpenter's works, in that some of his movies that are more celebrated today were flops when they came out. It had a major effect on his career, 
and it does make you wonder what his filmography would look like had some of his flops not lost so much money. The reaction to the thing though was downright ridiculous. At least it is painfully obvious today. Maybe there is, you know, misunderstood movies today that will go on to become classics in decades from now. But when you think that the original movie's director, Christian Nyby, publicly denounced the film, Roger Ebert hated it, Ennio Morricone's outstanding, bleak, minimalistic score, considered a classic of horror today, was nominated for a Razzie, you have to start asking, what exactly was everyone smoking in the 80s? Everything, probably. The Thing, with interestingly a huge budget for a horror movie back then, at $15 million, follows a research team in Antarctica that becomes infiltrated by a shape-shifting murderous alien which can take the form of any one of them, making anyone and everyone a suspect. Fear, paranoia and hysteria ensure in what is a spellbindingly captivating film from start to finish. It's one of my favourite movies and, as I've said before, left me completely flawed. This film is truly perfect. Better movies than The Thing exist, but if you're anal, you can always find little niggly things that could have been tweaked for some minor improvement. You'd be hard pressed though to find anything to improve in The Thing. It hits the mark in every single category. The collection of all male characters are memorable. You don't forget after watching The Thing, the likes of Mac, Charles, Blair, Windows and the Doc, and there's specific moments and quotes that always stick with you either because of their tension-diffusing humour, like Palmer's You Gotta Be Fucking Kidding, or enigmatic lines like McCready's Why Don't We Just Wait Here For A While, See What Happens. Essentially what the thing is, is a collection of perfectly executed horror sequences sewn flawlessly together. I did a breakdown on this channel about a year ago, if you're interested, in on the uh, defibrillator scene and how the scene achieves its effectiveness. But that one scene is a perfect representation of what makes the movie so great. The characters, the tension and the effects. The jaw-dropping practical effects. Special effects whiz Rob Bottin, only 22 at the time and eventually hospitalised with exhaustion, set a benchmark that has yet to be matched and most likely never will be. The sheer creativity and the ideas in the movie, from the spider head thing to the dog face splitting open, and then the technical ability to put that imagination onto celluloid. The creature scenes in the movie are ridiculously outrageous and they are only matched by Carpenter's mastery of the horror craft to form one of the most suspenseful and shocking horror movies of all time. Bravo. And how about the ending as well, eh? That in particular was one of the main reasons I just sat and stared blindly at the ending credits. I was so gobsmacked. The only other film I can think of where this occurred as a result of the ending was The Usual Suspects. It's so perfectly set up, it goes without saying the missing scene is as per usual perfect, but the spooky arrival of Charles, the dialogue between him and Mac, and the final grave few seconds before the film closes with a friendly reminder from Morricone why he's the best film composer around. It's so perfectly balanced in terms of evidence as to who, if anyone, is the thing. Perhaps they both are even, but the tragedy is, and ultimately the demonstration of how bleak of an impression the ending of the film gives, is that even if both of them are human, they are both dead, because soon the fire will die and they will freeze to death. John Carpenter and Stephen King seem like the perfect match, so it was interesting to see what the former could do with King's novel Christine, about a bullied youngster who buys a car off a weird old guy, and his parents and best friend noticed, he becomes obsessively attached to his new Plymouth Fury. Turns out the car has a mind of its own, and jealously harasses the main character's girlfriend and acts out revenge against those who bully him. If you didn't like Christine, ask yourself, how could a movie about a killer car driving around bumping people off possibly be better than this film is? I was surprised myself as I went through Carpenter's films especially Christine and the next one Starman, how much I enjoy these films, even though on paper they look silly. As goofy as the premise is, Christine has the magic touch of Carpenter, meaning we get the gorgeous Kundi widescreen photography, yet another groovy soundtrack, and quite simply, a great horror film. This is around where I started to feel that, aside from Halloween and The Thing, 
I don't really find Carpenter's movies scary, and yet the horror flicks that I am not frightened of, I still like. Why? Well, they're cool. And that's pretty much it, isn't it? Carpenter's movies just feel cool, laid back, and willing you to just have a good time. I always got a feeling of nostalgia watching Christine, even though I have no connection to the time period. It has a drive-in night feel, a kind of charm that seems reserved for a select few films from the 1980s. It has this magic feel that comes naturally, but one that quite a few recent projects like Stranger Things and It try to capture. Christine is also a really good looking film. There are some shots that make you smile at their, well just like I said, at how cool they are. The close up of the car's headlights as she charges on her rampages are iconic. And there's one particular shot as the fat dude Moochie is running away from the car and he looks for it. And in the distance you can see all these city lights and then one appears around the corner moving, perfectly synchronised to a chime in the thumping soundtrack. And then there's a sharp focus to reveal that it's Christine's headlights coming. That was bloody brilliant. Christine herself is beautiful, isn't she? The curves, the striking colour. Man, if I was alone in a garage with her, I'd, I'd strip down, grease up that exhaust and... Well, well I'd stop there. Apparently Carpenter directed Starman, incidentally his only movie that was nominated for an Oscar, because after the critical disaster that was the thing, he wasn't being offered projects and needed to direct something light and appealing so that he wouldn't get zoned out of Hollywood. It's such an odd choice for Carpenter, a quirky, offbeat, romantic comedy about an alien that takes the form of a woman's dead husband and asks her to drive him to where his ship will pick him up. As per usual, the music is top notch, but like with The Thing, wasn't composed by Carpenter himself this time. You'd think Carpenter's usual sense of style and a knack for dealing with action would be underutilised in a project that depends on the handling of the chemistry and relationship between the two central characters. As producer Michael Douglas put it though, people haven't seen this side of John, and they will be surprised to see how well he handles a love story, a comedy, a tender, touching romance. And that's exactly what Starman is. Again, goofy premise, but the movie is profoundly emotional, sweet and warm. It's funny in an innocent kind of way. The bond that develops between the two leads over the course of the film feels, feels so genuine, passionate and sincere. It's living proof that Carpenter could make an alien movie that didn't scare the shit out of people. The centerpiece relationship between Jeff Bridges and Karen Allen is dynamic, peculiar, and one of the better romance pairings that I can think of. And this is coming from someone who is usually quite dismissive and cynical of a lot of romantic relationships depicted in film, as so many come off as fake and unauthentic. And it really does live and die by the relationship between the two, because there's so many things, from what exactly Bridges is, to his people and way of life, to what happens to Karen after the end, and even just what the ship looks like. None of that is covered, because none of it matters. That's not what the film is about. And Carpenter, you really have to give it to the man. He's supposedly completely out of his element, and yet pulled the film off exceptionally. If I were to rank my top three John Carpenter movies, it'll probably go The Thing, Halloween, and then Big Trouble in Little China. The epic flop that would cause Carpenter to leave studio films and go back to independent cinema. Big Trouble is such a weird movie, so bizarre and wacky, and propelling the notion that everyone involved was high on sky. But it feels unique. It feels... What's the best way to describe it? What's the word? I suppose there isn't one. It's like a, it's a lightning in a bottle. It's quite simply Big Trouble in Little China. The story is insane and unexplainable, starting off with a guy looking to reclaim his stolen truck and ending with mass ninja brawls, underground monsters and 1000 year old Chinese magicians shooting lasers out of their hands. It's like one of those old time cartoonish serials, but it does have a genuinely great effects and acting. It's a bit like Escape from New York in terms of its wacky characters that you'd want to read about in a comic but kind of an inverted version whereby everything is grim in that film, but funny in this one. Kurt Russell plays the polar opposite of Snake, the dumb but charming all-American Jack Burton, who doesn't realise he's actually the sidekick in his own movie. It's hard to articulate what makes this film so special. High on absurdity levels, 
Big Trouble is probably best described as a B-movie on purpose, one that knows what it is and is unashamedly proud of it. There's a spirit to the film, a corny tongue-in-cheek approach in which all the actors are in on the joke. The film was also ahead of its time in a way. Martial arts films were currently big hits, what with this being around the time Jackie Chan unleashed Police Story and other films that brought him to Western attention, when today we see homages and parodies from the likes of Tarantino and Stephen Chow's Kung Fu Hustle, Carpenter was already doubling down on ridiculously over-the-top wire work martial arts. It also, in a way, takes the mick out of the archetype American beefcake hero, instead presenting a scenario where he bumbles from one scene to the next where, when his Asian friend is actually the real hero who rescues his girl in the end. There's loads of different things being explored, loads of different approaches being meshed, from Chinese mysticism with schlocky light 80s action, but because it's all been puppeteered by a master of the craft, it comes together in a picture that will never be replicated. So stay away with your remake, Dwayne Johnson. So after the failure of Big Trouble in Little China, Carpenter became fed up with Hollywood and went for a string of independent pictures. The first was Prince of Darkness in which a group of researchers discover a strange cylinder in an abandoned church that apparently holds the devil or something waiting to escape and wreak havoc. On paper, Prince of Darkness is classic Carpenter. It has one of his and Alan Howarth's best scores. There's a fine collection of actors including Carpenter regular Donald Pleasance. It has the Carpenter look, the Carpenter feel. The story also lends itself to a great horror outing the fear of the unknown, the looming presence of a coming evil and all that. So I was puzzled in wondering why the film doesn't work. There's just something off about it, something that doesn't quite pop. Dare I say it, the movie is a little dull, as not a lot happens given the majority of the movie is people standing around and waiting for something to happen. There is a whiff of atmosphere that isolated feeling of knowing the coming apocalypse is on its way. But the movie falls under par of expectations and hopes. Many of the characters were irrelevant, and the better ones like Pleasants are sidelined for wooden planks, and they just amble from room to room, not really bothered about the doomy gloomy state of affairs, and the green goo seems to inconsistently turn people into whatever the script feels is going to be most scary at any given point. But it isn't scary. I didn't feel any tension in the movie, despite the cool soundtrack. I think the movie was going for a kind of inevitable evil, biding its time, that kind of thing, but it doesn't quite pull it off. And I also got a little vibe from this film that Carpenter was attempting to go back to things he's done before. Maybe he was running out of ideas, but there's quite a few things that seem lifted from his previous films. It kind of felt like Carpenter was told to make a Carpenter movie, if that makes sense. There's one or two good scenes, like uh, where a man dissolves into a horde of beetles, or the I live, I live, I live part, and like I said, Carpenter's music is cool. I like the ending, there's something of a cliffhanger which doesn't really make sense too much when you think about it, but it is cool. I rolled my eyes at it on initial viewing because I felt Carpenter was trying to riff on the thing's ending, but it does have its merits. Carpenter would follow up from Prince of Darkness with the far superior They Live. It does seem that he is at his best when he tries new things, and at the same time retaining cool trademarks, instead of retreading old ground. This is a brilliant film, sticking two fingers up at corporate America, capitalism and the elite ruling class using social commentary in a cool but blaze way in which only Carpenter can. Ronnie Pike plays a drifter who is not the sharpest tool in the shed, who stumbles upon a conspiracy in which aliens have taken over the world and are living a life of luxury, all the while humans do the dog work. His attempts at convincing fellow construction worker Keith David result in one of the best street fights put on film, a hilarious 10 minute drawn out, exhausting compilation of grunts and thumps. After this, the two seek to expose this issue to the world, using guns, fists and catchphrases. As funny and charming as the film is, it's interesting in that it deals with real-world issues, more so even today than when the film was made. 
Whether you want to head into the territory of thinking the film's a showcase of the secret elite Zionist ruling class, a criticism of the Reagan era and unrestrained capitalism, or you genuinely believe aliens have taken over the world, the movie is a dream for conspiracy theorists and isn't far off really, especially since things like the Panama Papers prove that there really is a ruling class that leeches off the common folk and operates above the laws and regulations of normal society. It's one of the charms of the film that it is a goofy fun ride but also a chilling look into things like materialism, corporate greed, conformity and the consumer mentality. The fight scene for instance, funny as it is, in which Pipe only wants David to put on the glasses, goes on and on and on, and highlights that trying to get the sheep to see the truth of what their life is, is a painstaking and often fruitless task, because they often don't want to know, and would prefer to live life in their pseudo lives of comfort. A lot of highbrow pictures like Network and 1984 also touch on similar themes. They Live uses funny aliens as a proxy for our own concerns that we are being exploited by a group of people who through the media, food and simply through the ways of life have brainwashed us into not only accepting but actively taking part in self-slaving. And remember one of Dave's excuses that he's got a family to feed, a job to just about hold on to, which again is a common reason for people not to get involved and to just stay quiet. I mean, I know I'm going off on a tangent here, but the scariest thing about the Panama Papers was the reaction from the public, in that there was no reaction. The exploration of themes delved into They Live were quite rare for the time, and it also sticks out in Carpenter's filmography as an unusually socio-political film, despite being quintessential Carpenter. Maybe he offended someone with They Live. After all, it opened up at number one at box office in its first week, but then disappeared. At the very least, it was the end of Carpenter as we knew it, because the next chapter of his career, the latter half, is quite famous for bomb after bomb. Movies that stunk, movies that lost money, and as each disappointment came and went, Carpenter would eventually leave filmmaking only to make a half-fast return about 10 years later. He stopped scoring a lot of films, and the ones he did dropped his famous synth style for more conventional rock beats. He grew famously tired, frustrated with the studios and upset with the reception of his films, burnt out and found his time was better suited and more fun when playing video games and smoking at home with his son. It's not all doom and gloom for me though, because funnily enough, I find enough in most of these movies to enjoy. The first of these films is a studio movie called Memoirs of an Invisible Man, in which Chevy Chase turns invisible after an accident and is chased by the CIA, while trying to maintain his connection with his love interest, a kind of comedic version of The Invisible Man. Carpenter was disappointed with the final product, saying Warner Brothers was simply interested in making audience-friendly, non-challenging movies, and yes it is lightweight, it does have a clinical 90s studio film feel about it, but it is a decent film. It lacks the heart of Starman, despite being similar in story setup, but it was quite entertaining. I found a lot of the jokes landed well, and the special effects in achieving the invisibility and everything that goes with it was superb. It's not a bad movie by any means. Light, as I said, inoffensive, and not a game changer in any sense of the word, but a decent chase film. After this, Carpenter worked on the project Body Bags, which is a kind of creepshow style film having three different short films which are presented by the coroner, played by Carpenter. It was originally a TV show pilot that failed, so they made it into a movie. Tobe Hooper directed one of these shorts and Carpenter did the other two. I don't remember much of it, but I remember liking it. The first movie, if I remember correctly, was about a lady working at a nighttime service station, which can often be a spooky and dangerous place where you have all sorts of weirdos turn up from the highway. She ends up getting stalked by some dude. This is vintage Carpenter, in which he creates a scary story from the simplest of premises. There's one shot I remember of the main character in the forefront, and the bad guy who you think has snuffed it gets up and slowly starts walking towards her with the music pulsating from behind her. That scene would send Halloween fans over the edge, because it's a clear homage. The second one is a goofy comedic short, where a middle-aged man with long hair has a fear of going bold, and decides to try out a new experimental scientific method. 
It's pretty funny and light, but ends up in a wild and disturbing place. Then Carpenter made In the Mouth of Madness, a homage title to Lovecraft's work, where an investigator explores the enigmatic figure of writer Sutter King. This is a much respected late output from Carpenter among the horror communities, and this has made me consider a rewatch, but I didn't think much of it. For one, though it was well made, well shot, and well acted, it didn't have the usual aesthetics of John Carpenter's movies, and its story, although ambitious, when delving into the meta aspects, it got quite messy and started to trip up over its own feet. I felt the movie was trying to be too clever for its own good. It was a departure from the usual Carpenter fear. He was trying something new, which is something I praised him for earlier. The horror here is more surreal, and there are philosophical questions being pondered. But it was quite dull though, and when it all kicks off in the end, we only get a blink and you'll miss it glimpse at the monsters in the movie. Carpenter's next flick, The Village of the Damned remake, clearly highlighted the traction of the director's ongoing fatigue. This is one of the few films he's made that I flat out didn't like full stop, mainly because it lacks the Carpenter feel. Similar to In the Mouth of Madness, it doesn't have his trademark flourish, his instantly recognisable touch. The movie starts off interestingly enough, I haven't seen the original so the plot was intriguing, a strange, unexplained entity arrives at a small town and suddenly everyone falls asleep. When they wake up, all the women are pregnant. They end up giving birth to these weird aliens posing as children. It's interesting, I guess, in the sense that the weird carpenter horror entities this time are in the form of innocent, or apparently innocent, children. But to be perfectly honest, this movie felt so lightweight, so utter devoid of horror, and it was left gasping for something to pick it up, something to give it a reason to keep going. It was just so boring, so stale feeling and wooden. It felt like Carpenter was going through the motions, and contains very little of significance that offers any memorability. Now, my opinion on Carpenter's next few films might have you questioning my sanity. A sequel to Escape from New York was always talked about, and by the time it was made, Carpenter was creatively and physically exhausted. The result was Escape from LA, which is more or less a remake of New York in a way, in which the rugged Pliskin is sent to discover, sorry, recover a doomsday device from LA, now a prison island. This is a much laughed at sequel, and rightfully so, it is an insult to those who waited for a sequel to New York for years and years. Here's the thing, I wasn't one of those people, because New York was before my time. I watched LA the parody of New York, on TV, and truth be told, I had a blast. It was terrific. It was so cheesy, so outdated, so audacious. You've got the entire budget used up in the first 10 minutes with some decent earthquakes, and we end up in an insane world where Kurt Russell rides a tsunami wave in order to chase Steve Buscemi who's evading him on four wheels, high-fiving his partner along the way. It's so entertaining but so dumb. Like the scene where Snake has to make an impossible basketball shot in a problematic time frame. The characters were actually quite cool, in a goofy way, Bruce Campbell's freakish plastic surgeon being one of the more notables. This is the kind of movie that we're told we have to hate, that we need to stick our noses up at, lest we become outcasts in movie-going cliques. But deep down, we all knew seeing Kurt Russell and a transsexual Pam Greer pounce down and gliders, shooting up an amusement park is just what we needed to see. The ending is so B-movie galore and ballsy as well, a great climax to one of the more batshit films you'll see. Snake is back, baby. I've always uh, appreciated vampires. It deconstructs the romance associated with the creatures and instead is quite a gruff and violent film, full of crude profanity and sweat that makes you feel kind of dirty and in need of a shower after seeing it. Out of all of Carpenter's later works, it's probably the closest to his heyday, in, at least in terms of his trademark aesthetic, but there is the added element of the movie being loud, nasty and rude, which is the departure from his usual cool and charming films. The movie has a really nasty feel, it feels hateful like it was made with venom, the characters aren't particularly likeable, and I wasn't quite sure what to make of it. Would I see it again? Probably not. But it wasn't exactly a bad movie. It just feels like it came a bit late when you see films like The Lost Boys, which 
are able to make vampires scary but also spread comedy into the mix. Vampires is quite a simple film, macho and harsh. But where Kurt Russell might have gave the camera a quick wink wink, James Wood's stoic lips remain uncurled and unsmiling. Carpenter's music was good fun and there is a strange appeal to the film. It seems to be modelled on western tropes, which is nice I guess since Carpenter was a big fan of many westerns but never actually made one. I would have liked to see what Carpenter would have done though with vampires in his prime. By the way, did anyone notice that vampires had this really weird shot transition where it would have this fade effect? Very strange and slightly distracting, especially since it makes you quite sleepy. Ghost of Mars. Now, this was the big one, wasn't it? The time Carpenter jumped the shark, drank the Kool-Aid or whatever else you want to say about it. And say what you want about it because Ghost of Mars is awesome. Fight me. Like Escape from LA, it's so horrendously cheesy, so ridiculously unfortunate in its creative decisions. It's so damn stupid, but it's an absolute riot. There's a group of police officers in the 22nd century Mars, including Pam Grier and Jason Statham, who have to pick up a dangerous criminal played by Ice Cube, who in my headcanon I like to think is supposed to be Russell Snake Plissken, but get caught up by some weird Martian race who end up hunting them down. Interestingly, the film seems to encompass various elements from the classic Carpenter movies, like a creepy fog, aliens which assimilate people, and characters held up against a massive horde. I read on IMDb Trivia that the main Martian bad guy, Big Daddy, ad-libbed his dialogue. Yeah, no shit, when, whenever the camera finds him, he's literally screaming, What the hell? What is that supposed to be? And Ice Cube's desperate attempts at being cool, scrunching up his face, the weird narrative where there are flashbacks within flashbacks within flashbacks, the cheesy ending which seemingly finished in the middle of the story, and the fact that this expensive film looks like it was shot on some low-budget B-movie set in the 60s. As they say, give Carpenter $500,000 and he'll make your film look like it was made for $3 million. Give him $50 million and he'll still ensure it looks like it was made for $3 million. I can't believe they had almost $30 million to play with and yet the film turned out the way it did. That being said, remember what I said about Big Trouble in Little China having a special kind of magic? Ghost of Mars has its own magic. It's probably a jug full of cocaine, but still, if you enjoy a film, you enjoy it. And I had a blast watching this flick. The acting is horrible, and the bad guys look like the filmmakers picked up hobos off the street. And you'll ask yourself during the movie, why is everything red? I can't explain it. It's an enigma. I like it though. The worst sin a film can commit is being boring. And the worst Carpenter movies like Village of the Damned are the ones that are boring. Ghost of Mars, for all its faults, is definitely not a boring film. Which can't be said exactly for his last picture, The Ward, which marked his return from a nine-year absence from cinema. He directed two TV episodes of Masters of Horror, one being Cigarette Burns, which I've seen, and it was great, so he still had the talent. But The Ward makes you question whether he should just stick to playing his video games and shouldn't have bothered returning to film, because though The Ward is you know, definitely watchable, it lacks Carpenter's magic and is painfully cliched. It's like Carpenter's stuck in some time warp, unable to move on, where he hasn't realised that the elements of the ward have been done to death. Truth be told, we wouldn't look twice at the ward had it not had Carpenter's name attached to it. There are no decent ideas, no genuine scares. It feels like a knockoff, and it's sad in a way that Carpenter seemingly became content with making run of the mill average cookie cutter horror fare. So many of his movies, even the weird ones like Ghost of Mars, stick out for being different, being unique. But there's nothing unique about this film. It's not terrible, but it's just, it's just there. It exists. Nothing more. There's no snap. Nothing is memorable. No scene. No characters. Okay, the last scene got me, but that's about it. The movie relies on tried and tested formulas that by this point had become stale, and it needed someone with vigour not a burnt-out carpenter to steer it. Still though, John Carpenter is one of my favourite directors. He's provided me with so many thrills, so many great characters and music pieces, and it doesn't hurt that he seems to be a very cool dude also. I do hope that one day we might see him in the director's chair again, 
perhaps that Dead Space movie or the Dark Child one that has been talked about. The recent Christine music video shows he's still oozing with creativity, even if he doesn't have the drive anymore. Whether he does or he doesn't, Carpent has left us with enough to cement his title as the master of horror. I am a huge fan of him, and his distinct style and his films have left a huge imprint on my movie watching journey. Thank you John for all the wonderful memories, and thank you for sticking with this podcast for this very long. See you next time.